loving that y'all are digging on your own now. Um, this week, we're going to move from chapter four to chapter five. And when you get to chapter five, we've got some things happening around the throne, some things concerning the 24 elders. So a little extra homework that I want you to do is go to YouTube and I want you in the search bar to search for 24 elders animation. And I just want you to look at, um, there's many, 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 many animation cartoon um, images that people have put together in a movie form that are just two or three minutes long explaining the 24 elders or showing you a vision of what's happening in Revelation 5. And it just, you know, if you're having a hard time picturing it, it's neat to see how other people have shown us. They've given us a show and tell. So um, just go look for, for your own interest, you know, to kind of help. And here's something else. You'll notice things they got wrong because you've done your homework and have gone word for word, not just looking at Revelation 5, but you've gone back to Ezekiel and to Isaiah. So you know the details in there and you'll see what they put in and what they left out. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, well, the first thing we want to do is um, we're going to go word for word through chapter 4. After these things, that phrase in the Greek is called metatauta, after these things, and it's used several times in the book of Revelation, after these things. So metatauta, um, he says, I looked, and let's ask the question, after what things? What has just what has John just told us about in chapters two and three? The churches. So after these things, after what things? After the churches. So this is your first clue that the rapture happened right here. After these things. Because remember the outline in chapter one, John was supposed to write the things which you have seen, which was chapter one, the things which are, which were the churches existing on the earth, and then the things which take place after these things, after the things which are. So after the church, now everything else from this point forward, we're going to see what happens after the rapture. So that's our first clue. You can't build a doctrine on that, but that's our first clue that rapture happens here. Okay, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So just to note, where was John standing in chapters 2 and 3? Yeah, he was on the earth. Do you remember in, in chapter 2, he was on the island of Patmos, and he heard behind him a sound, and then they saw the vision, and the lampstands were on the, the earth, and Jesus was walking among the lampstands. So now in chapter 4, he heard a voice... Um, Behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of trumpets speaking with me. Okay, he's referring back to that verse he heard in chapter 1. That first voice that I heard speaking with me that sounded like a trumpet said, Come up here. Come up where? Come up to heaven. So John was taken to heaven, and he said, I will show you what must take place after these things. So immediately... And that word for immediately is the same word that we get the, the catching away in a twinkling of an eye. It's the same word for twinkling of an eye and immediately. Smallest, uh, smallest segment of time. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. Who do you think one sitting on the throne was? God. That should be a green triangle there. One sitting on the throne. And he, who, uh, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow round about the throne like an emerald in appearance. Okay, we've got several colors going on here. We have the jasper. Um, one thing to know uh, is that over the years, the 
colors of the stones in the breastplate, the, name, the names of those colors have changed. And they got uh, convoluted during the days of Babylon. So the original colors of those breastplates, if you go back to the Old Testament, that you're going to see contradictions from what's in Revelation. And you're going, well, wait a minute. There shouldn't be any contradiction. But it's because in in the New Testament, we're looking at Babylonian interpretations of the colors. So some of these stones, we have no idea what the color is because that word doesn't exist. All we can do is speculate. Um, the best thing to do is go back to the Old Testament and look at the original breastplate that the priest wore and, and go by those 12 colors. But some of these are just, you know, you're going to get you're going to get two or three different definitions depending on the source you look at. Um, let's talk about the heaven where John is. I was an earth science teacher. It was not my forte, meaning um, I tried to just stay a week ahead of the kids, you know, when I was my first year teaching. I was a life science. That's my expertise was more in life science rather than earth science. But what I did learn, I was at a private Christian school, so what I could do was compare our heavens, according to science, to the heavens that are mentioned in the Bible. And I got in a lot of trouble because kids were going home telling their parents about this third heaven, and they had never heard it. And I thought, well, did you read Paul? You know? No, no. In the spirit or out of the spirit was taken to the third heaven. And, okay, that's in First Corinthians, I believe. So, um, but I got in a lot of trouble because they said I was teaching Mormon doctrine mm -hmm. at a Christian school. <laughs> no, 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 no. Read your Bible, read your Bible. Um, so let me just explain. The first heaven is the air. It is our atmosphere. The air we breathe, breathe where the birds fly, where the airplanes fly is a, is a different level, but it's still first, the first heaven. This is Satan's rulership. He is ruler of the power of the air, and he's roaming about seeking whom he can devour. So this is the, the um, first heaven. The second heaven is outer space, where the stars and the moon and the planets are. The third heaven is God's throne room. Every one of these visions from Ezekiel to Isaiah, Revelation 1, Revelation 4, they're all dealing with the third heaven, and that is the throne room of God. Remember when Moses um, encountered God and God instructed him to make a blueprint or make a pattern of everything he saw in heaven on earth. That's how he got the tabernacle pattern. That's how he knew about the outer court and the inner court and the holy of holies and then the throne room. The, I mean the, the holy place and then the holy of holies which was the throne room of God where there was an ark of covenant that formed and the cherubim were under the seat under the throne of God and God's presence came down and dwelt on the what's well, called the mercy seat but the cherubim's wings actually formed the mercy seat. So all of these things that Moses did on earth for the earthly tabernacle and later the earthly temple were based on a, a first eyewitness account of what he saw in the throne room of God. So here uh, we know that the throne room of God, boy, that's, there's nothing there. That's where God dwells. You know, that's his holy of holies is the third heaven. Okay, we also see a shift in audience in um, chapter 4. We're going to look at all these symbols that we're talking about. We've already mentioned the um, colors of stones and how they have something to do with the breastplate of the, the priest. Everything from chapter 4 onward is all very Jewish in nature. Everything we saw in chapter 2 and 3 were written to the churches and they are symbols and similes that we would, uh, metaphors that we would understand. 
but starting in chapter four, they're very Jewish in nature, and some of them may be strange to us if we're not students of the Old Testament. We may have a hard time understanding that. But So the more familiar we are with uh, Jewish culture, the more we're going to understand the rest of the book of Revelation. Okay. Um, and by the way, there is under the earth, there is a thing under the earth or at the center of the earth and that's where Hades is lost souls demons etc okay now he says um, he who was sitting he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance that word rainbow can mean um a halo. When we get all excited when we see, you know, the beginning of a rainbow and the we see a whole rainbow. You know, it's not just a, a quarter of it reaching into the sky. We see it come back down. It starts on the earth and goes to heaven and arches back down. We love seeing that. We love seeing a double rainbow or a triple rainbow. But if you can imagine that rainbow circling all the way around the throne. And it could be this way. You know, we don't know what direction it makes sense that it would be this way. It's an aura of color. It's just, and I believe that our eyes cannot even see the colors that exist in heaven. I think that when we get our new bodies, our eyes are going to be able to see into the unseen world, the things we can't see. There's angels all around us right now. And we can't see them, but we know they're there. And he's going to give us eyes to see that. He's also going to give us eyes to see colors we've never seen before, which I think is going to be amazing. Beautiful beyond comprehension. Okay, um, around the throne were 24 thrones. I would love to see how y'all drew this. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders. What were they doing? Sitting. Anytime you see someone sitting, that means their work is completed. They are resting. When you're seated, you are resting. It doesn't mean forever. It means right now they're taking a rest. And they were sitting and they were clothed in white garments. That means they have bodies, right? If they're wearing a robe, they have bodies. And they also have golden crowns on their head. These crowns are not royal crowns. These are crowns that they won. These are victor's crowns. I believe the word for it is Stephanos. Stephanos is a victor's crown. The royal crown. It's a lot like the um, Olympic wreaths they used to give in the Olympic Games back in the early days of the Olympics. That the Greeks would, you know, they wear their toga and have the <laughs> the um, the victor's crown, the victor's wreath on their head. Out of the out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Okay, where have we seen that before? How many visions had the lightning and the thunder coming from the throne? Do you have that on your T-chart, Carla? Y'all have that in your notes? It seems like every time that the throne of God is mentioned that you, there's thunder and lightning going on, which means a lot of energy. It means the source of energy, the source of power is coming from the throne. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And what are they? The seven spirits of God. So last time we were together, I mentioned that the lampstand had was a seven-branch lampstand, 
and it had seven lamps of fire on top of it. The lampstand was different than the fire. The lampstand represented the churches. The fire represented the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm not doing a very good job showing y'all my um, PowerPoint that I worked out. There's a picture of the lampstand. And then he said, um, these are these are the seven spirits of God. So that's a picture of what it looks like. Notice he doesn't say there's seven lampstands. He says there's seven lamps of fire. And these are the seven spirits of God. So it appears that there's only one lampstand now in heaven. It could indicate that there's more, but the difference between Revelation 1 and Revelation 4 is the lampstands were on the earth in chapter 1, and now they're in heaven before the throne. This represents this one lampstand with the seven spirits of God represents that the Holy Spirit of God is now in heaven. Okay, right now, during the church age, where is the Holy Spirit? Inside of each one of us. If we're a believer, we are the ones that carry the Holy Spirit on the earth. And here it says, the Holy Spirit's before the throne. So that's clue number two, that the rapture has occurred at this chapter. Um, and before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. The sea of glass is interesting because anytime we see the sea in Revelation, it appears to be talking about a group of people. But that's, at this point, we don't have enough evidence. We haven't gotten to all those other places yet, but this is the first time the sea is mentioned. There's a crystal sea coming from the throne. And in the center and around the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. So we have these four living creatures, and these, this is interesting. We've got one with an, the face of an eagle, one the face of a lion, the face of a man, and the face of an ox. Now in Ezekiel, it mentioned, it called the, the one with the face of the ox, it called the face of a cherub. Well, who on earth knows what a cherub looks like? I mean, that, that's my question to, was it Isaiah or Ezekiel? That, I think it was Ezekiel that saw the cherub. Why on earth would he call it a cherub? But an ox, or, and some um, call it a calf. So it's a, a calf is a young ox or a young, a young ox. I mean, a, a young cow, a young bull, a young ox would be a calf. Um, so a cherub would have a baby face. And I think that's why people draw cherubs with these cute little baby faces and it should be a baby animal face. You know, it should be a baby cow face, but instead they, you know, make it a little baby. So um, that's where, that's how I think you can reconcile it. I think it's the same, it's just a different language. It's just a different description because nobody on earth knew what a cherub was. So it's interesting that he described it as such. Um, so we can, we can kind of uh, reconcile those things. Okay, let's look at, um, it's interesting that they were full of eyes in front and behind, and we already discussed that, so they could see all around them, even though they couldn't turn around, they were able to see the throne at all times. Um, the first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, and the third creature like the face of that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And we'll talk about what those mean the eagle represents God. The lion represents Jesus. You can tell by the colors that I've used. Man represents man. And the ox, we think, represents the Holy Spirit. That's speculation. 
but he's the only one left, right? <laughs> he's the only one left. This is what it looked like. Now remember, Moses drew the pattern for the tabernacle according to what he saw in heaven and according to the instructions that God gave him. So when they set up the tabernacle in the wilderness, desert, think of a flat plain desert that they're wandering in, and they're trapped, they set up the tabernacle wherever God stops. He's leading them by cloud during the day and by fire at night, and when the cloud stops or the fire stops, they stop, and it's time to set up camp. And the first thing they do is set up the tabernacle. And then in the book of Exodus, we have detailed instructions of how each tribe is supposed to line up. He divided them into four groups. Now, all 12 tribes had a flag with a, a logo on it. And then he made four leaders of the tribes. He divided them into four groups. Those 12 groups were divided into four groups. And he had leaders that were to be the head of those three tribes. They each had, you know, three with them. So, or two other tribes besides themselves. And he said, you camp. These tribes are to camp behind Dan. And then you look at the image that's on Dan's flag. And you go, ah. Oh. So if you look at your handout, if you were flying over the desert in a helicopter back in those days, this is what you would see. This is the camp of Israel. Some Bibles have it in a square configuration, but if you take the Bible literally, and he says from the east corner to the west corner, that means they can't pass that corner. They can't camp on the angles. So this is what it looks like. And if you look at the four leading ensigns or flags with the images on them, you see the same images that of the four living creatures. You see Dan has the, his image was the eagle, which represents God. And then Judah, remember he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's why the lion represents Jesus. Um, then Reuben, his name meant man, I think it meant first man. And then um, Ephraim was the ox. And we think that's the Holy Spirit. Now let me go even further. We're gonna look at the four gospels. And you can look at that handout that you have. When we look at the four gospels, the gospel of John presented Jesus as being fully God. So the Gospel of John represents the eagle. The Gospel of Matthew was written to the Jews, and he was presenting Jesus as Messiah, the Lion of the King of Judah. That's where that's mentioned. The Gospel of Luke, remember he was a doctor, and he recorded all the details about what Jesus went through um, as being fully man. So he presented Jesus as fully man. And then the Gospel of Mark is like little snapshots of things that Jesus did in his ministry, and it presented Jesus as the suffering servant or the ox, the one that carried the burden for us. There's the colors of the, um, I thought I had that chart in here and I didn't put it in here. Before we move on to the chart of the breastplate, um, look at the chart that I gave you, your handout. It says the, the design structure of the four Gospels. And there you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke all grouped together because they're what's called the synoptic Gospels. That means they're all covering the same events from a different point of view. So you get a little more added detail, but basically the same stories most of the time. John was completely different because he was um, presenting Jesus as being from eternity to eternity. He was the great I am. Remember, there were seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. 
So when you look in the left column, um, you see how they were presented. Um, Matthew was Messiah, Mark the suffering servant, Luke fully man, John fully God. Matthew started his genealogy, he started the, the book with his genealogy, and he went back to Abraham, showing how Jesus was the seed, the Messiah, the coming Messiah. So he, um, because that's where the promise came, the promise was going to come through Abraham. Then Mark had no genealogy listed in his book, but that's because no one's concerned about the pedigree or the genealogy of a servant. And then Luke, being fully man, traced his genealogy back to Adam, being fully the first firstborn man. And then John's genealogy goes back to eternity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was showing his deity. Um, Matthew focused on what Jesus said, Mark on what he did, Luke on how he felt, and then John on who he was. And then the first miracle in Matthew, the leper was cleansed. In Mark and in Luke, a demon was expelled. And then in John, the first official miracle was turning the water into wine. And then it ends with, Matthew ends with the resurrection story. Mark ends with the ascension story. Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And John ends with the promise of the return of Jesus. All of these things, the throne room vision, the camp of Israel, and the way the Gospels were written and presented, only by the Holy Spirit could all these connections be seen. It just shows more evidence of how this book was written by one author who knows it all and connects it all. And so the deeper we study, the more connections we see. But this just shows how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of it. You know, we see God is trying to get us back to the throne room. And in chapter 4, we're there. Okay, let's go back to um, verse 8 in chapter 4. The four living creatures, each one of them having six wings. This is interesting. Six wings. Somebody else said four. Do you remember that? Um, I can't remember which one. The seraphim had seraphim had six wings, and the cherubim had four wings. And the cherubim, what? They had two hands. Yeah, they had hands underneath there because they were able to. I was thinking was that like they had they didn't have six wings, they had four wings and two hands. They still had six. Oh, they still had six appendages. That's a good point. Because um, they were able to take the coal and, and things like that. But I believe, uh, people like to equate them, but I believe they're two different beings. Because in Ezekiel, did it, in, in all of the visions, the cherubim were under the throne or round about the throne. And above them, all of this stuff was happening. And in the earthly tabernacle on the mercy seat, the cherubim are under the throne and God's presence dwelt above them. So if you think about it, where the four living creatures are, where the 24 elders are, they're all on the same level, but the throne is above them. What was, where were the seraphim? They were above the throne. So I believe the cherubim and the seraphim were two different levels of beings, and the cherubim were under the throne, and the seraphim flew above the throne. Just my opinion. Could be right, could be wrong. We'll find out when we get there for sure. <laughs> but that, uh, that's just what I think. Okay, so they have um, six wings. They're full of eyes around and within, and day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. A lot of people think the holy, holy, holy is for the Trinity. Holy is God. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Holy Spirit. Um, and when the living creatures give glory 
and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. What do the 24 elders do? Where are they seated? They're around the throne. So they're seated on thrones around the throne and they fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. Remember, these are victor's crowns. So how did they earn victor's crowns? Do you remember the promises to the seven churches? He who overcomes, I will give you this crown, that crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, the victor's crown. If you overcome, you'll get the victor's crown. So these are... These are people who have uh, overcome. They've won something. They've, they've won something. This is a victor's crown. 24 represents government in, uh, in the numbers. 12 is really the number for government, but then any factor of 12 represents some kind of government. A lot of people will say that um, these are 12 elders from the 12 tribes of Israel and then the 12 apostles from the New Testament church, Old Testament, New Testament together, or Israel and, and Jews together. But that can't be the case because God has not dealt with Israel yet. Israel is not finished yet. This, this can only be the church if these are men. We think they're men because first of all, they're seated. Um, second of all, they are wearing robes, so they have bodies. They also have one crowns. So they're not some kind of heavenly being or an angel because they've won something. You know, and angels are never ever mentioned as um, winning crowns. They're in warfare, but they don't seem to win crowns. So people, the most uh, research, and we're going to go into depth in into who these 24 elders are next week because when you get to chapter 5 there's a little bit more information about them so we're going to save the discussion of who the 24 elders are but it's very very interesting uh, when you're trying to figure out are these men or are these heavenly people um, elders were described in the new testament the churches had elders over them so whether it's if 24 is just a, repre a representation of the whole church, it could be that. It could be 24 chosen elders from Jesus' ascension to the rapture uh, that get to wear these crowns. We know they're overcomers. They've won them. But we all get rewards based on what we do here on earth. So we will all have crowns. And we looked at the list in detail last week about what those five crowns that are available to earn are or to win. We've seen those. So be thinking about that as you continue your study. Try to figure out, you know, and I don't know that we'll ever get the answer until we get there, but it appears that they are men, that they have new bodies, and that they <clears throat> cast their crowns before the Lord and worship the Lord. Then what are they saying? They cast their crowns before the throne and they're saying, worthy are you. Who's Lord? Our Lord. And that word Lord is Jesus. So worthy are you, Jesus, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. That's how we know it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who created all things. And because of your, your will, God's will, they existed and were created. So we see a picture of the Trinity. We see the glory and the honor. We have a few minutes left, so I want to go to... Um, let me go back in my notes here. I want to go to Exodus 19. 
And I want to look at this trumpet. When you start trying to figure out who this trumpet is that's speaking, it's probably an angel. But it is specific and it is, uh, we can know what it is generally because it's occurred before. Exodus 19, 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the mountain. So there's another picture, just like the throne room picture. Here's another picture of that trumpet sound, the, peal, the thunder and the lightning, and that accompanies God. It's also used in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this is the trumpet of God. When God appears, the trumpet sounds. He did in Exodus and he does here. Okay, let's look for a second at the differences between the rapture and the second coming. So that you can see the difference in the rapture um, this is in first uh, corinthians 4 that whole uh, starting at 16 he says in verse 17 then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so we shall always be with the lord therefore comfort one another with these words so in the rapture Jesus comes for his own. He comes for his bride, for his church. In the second coming, he comes with his own. We are with him on white horses with the angels of heaven. In the rapture, we're translated from earth up to heaven. In the second coming, we're coming from heaven to earth. During the rapture, we are not judged for our sin. We are judged for our deeds. This is the Bema Seat of Christ. This is where we stand before Christ and he looks at the treasures we've laid in heaven. He's judged our works, and then we're rewarded for that. In his second coming, he's coming, the, this is the wrath of the Lamb. I mean, he's coming back to judge the whole earth. Um, the rapture happens before the day of wrath. We're gonna look at that in more detail, but we were not destined for wrath believers were not destined for wrath and remember in the letters to the churches he said if you overcome I will keep you from the hour of testing or if you don't I will make you go through the hour of testing so um, he rescues us out of the day of wrath there's no reference to Satan during the rapture but for the second coming that's when he's going to bind Satan and put him in chains in a pit for a thousand years. He's coming for his saints. The rapture is to rapture the saints, the people who have died in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will all go up and meet Jesus in the, in the air. He comes to claim his bride, the second coming. Uh, oh, when he comes back the second time, his feet will be on Mount Zion, and that's where the judgment happens in the earth. Great earthquake, Mount, Mount Zion will split in two. Um, he claims his bride. Second coming, the bride is with him. In the rapture, nobody sees him. In the twinkling of an eye, there's a disappearance. In the second coming, every eye will behold him, and every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then after the rapture, some point after the rapture, the tribulation begins. After the second coming, the thousand year reign begins. Can you see
see those differences. Does that encourage you that we're not going to have to go through? I mean, things are bad right now. Things are really bad, and they're going to get worse. Um, we need to continually read Matthew 24. We have a, a few minutes, so let's all turn to Matthew 24. started verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Okay, he's referring to the temple and 70 years later, in 70, well, 38 years later, in 70 AD the temple was destroyed. So that came true. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? Two things, what's the sign of your coming? What's the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. That's why you're here studying Revelation right now so that you will not be misled in the last days. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. As the day approaches, that's going to happen more and more. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. This is an important phrase, and I would mark it. But this is not yet the end. He says, we're going to have wars and rumors of wars, but that's not a sign of the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquake. But all these are merely the beginning of birth pains. So we're talking, he's comparing the end times to a woman in labor and the wars and rumors of wars and the famines, that's the beginning of the end. He says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. We are seeing that this week. It's all, all the truth is coming out. All the people who hate Israel, who hate the Jews, who want a two-state solution in Israel. They want Israel to give the Gaza Strip to the Palestinians. Israel cannot give their land away. They are in covenant with God. God says, this is my land, do not give it away, or else I'm, judgment will come to them. And so every time, you, and, and remember the scripture, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Back when George W. Bush was president, he was on board with this two-state two solution and was you know, they were all doing all these peace accords and trying to get these settlements. And President Bush was recommending that they, you know, to keep the peace, that they give the land to the Palestinians. Okay, the Palestinians were, are not Jewish. They are immigrants who came over. They're, they originate from the Philistines. They were a nomadic uh, people, and they came in and settled and they want their own government. And Israel is saying, no, that's our land. We can't give it to you. God gave it to us and told us we couldn't give it away. <laughs> so every time any nation, including the United States, recommends this two-state solution, God's hand of protection comes against us, and we see catastrophes. Our land is cursed. And so we always, always <coughs> must remain Israel. We have to stand with Israel because to be against Israel is to be against God. He said, I will bless you who bless Israel. I will curse you who curse Israel. So if we don't want to live under the curse of God, we must stand and support Israel at all costs, even if their leadership is corrupt. And we may be finding that out soon. 
but even if they have a corrupt government, that's not our problem. God is the one who puts kings and removes kings. So he, he places kings and removes kings. Our only response is to follow the word of God. Bless Israel no matter what. And even President Biden yesterday was on his way to uh, meet with the leaders and he was going to suggest a, a peaceful solution, give them the land. They're never gonna be at peace because they hate Israel. They want to wipe out Israel. They want to wipe out America, period. And they want to wipe us out because we're a friend of Israel. So, and we have the largest population of, of Jewish people in our nation than any other nation in the world. Although that's decreasing because many are returning to the homeland. Okay, so um, I've got a minute left. They will deliver you to tribulation and kill you because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. If you listen to the news, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who to believe. The propaganda is so rampant out there that you have to really be careful who you listen to to find the truth. Um, lawlessness is increased. We're seeing that. In our news every day most people's love will grow cold this is the love of the brethren Jude talks about that the love of the brethren will grow cold that means people in the church will turn against one another but the one who endures to the end he will be saved who's going to be alive during the tribulation the Jews the church is out of here so during the tribulation, we're going to see a great revival of uh, Jewish people who become believers. And he says, those who endure to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So it's not the one, it's, it's one who's reading this word. This was not meant for the disciples back then. This is future. Those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are out of his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. So who would be concerned that it comes in the, on the Sabbath? The Jews, because they're not allowed to walk a certain amount of time or distance on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation. So we've got two different, we've got a tribulation and then we've got a great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who are the elect? Mary was called the elect. And um, when Jesus was on the cross, uh, one of the letters that John wrote was to the elect lady. And we think that the elect lady was Mary, and she was Jewish. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. That's where discernment comes in. they got to know who to trust and who to believe. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So we are going to cover so, we're going to cover Matthew 24. That's going to be a vital uh, cross-reference scripture through the rest of Revelation. We're going to refer to it a lot. One of the things that we absolutely must know is that who the restrainer is. Right now, we have the Holy Spirit. Right now, the Holy Spirit in us is what restrains evil. And so once we are taken out of here, the Holy Spirit is now before the throne in heaven. So 
there is no restrainer to restrain immorality or ridiculous laws or uh, dictatorship, a new world order, a digital currency, taking the mark of the beast. We're the ones who are standing up and, and with the outcry saying, no, 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 that's against God's word. Once we're out of here, there is no restrainer anymore. The voice of the people is gone. So that's what's going to lead to so much chaos and world turmoil. So praise God we get to go first. Praise God. Any questions today? <laughs>